In your Bible, especially if you use ESV, we use ESV in this church, you'll see this passage is in brackets. And some translation even don't have this passage. From John chapter 7, verse 53, to John chapter 8, verse 11. Some translation omit this passage altogether. Others put it in the footnote. If you have ESV, you have it in brackets with a, mass- with a footnote saying, early manuscripts do not have this passage, do not include this passage. So what does it mean? What does it mean when it says the earliest manuscripts do not include this? It simply means this. We got so many manuscripts of, uh, of the Bible, like thousands of them, and the earliest versions that we have, meaning the more accurate versions, because back in those days, they don't have printing press. How do they distribute scriptures? They copy them by hand, you see. So the earlier the manuscript, the more accurate it is. The more copy you make, the more mistake you make along the way, right? So the earliest manuscripts we have do not include this. So what are we to do? So most scholars believe this. That's this passage, John 7, 53 to 8, 11, was not written by John. It's not written by John and it's not considered to be the Word of God because of that. So what are we doing here today? Perhaps you say maybe we should just go home and the passage is not the Word of God. But no, um, while, while it's not written by John, it's been added quite earlier on to the Scripture by the early church. And it's been added to different places, and this is one of the most common places that it has been included in. It's added in there because it is quite consistent to the teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ, and is very consistent to the character of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's added specifically here by most of the manuscripts is because we believe it added commentary to what is before this passage and what is after this passage just additional explanation so small scholars believe while it's not written by john it's very very likely the event happened that this incident of jesus with the adulterous women happened it's just not written by john okay so there in the sense because it's consistent with the character of our Lord Jesus Christ, and it's, it's more scholars agree that likely to happen, um, there's a place for us to learn. Just because it's not the Word of God, there's still lessons for us to learn from this. So the lesson we're going to learn from this is not inconsistent with the rest of the Gospel or the rest of the Scripture. Okay? It's consistent. So there's value for us to look at this passage. So that's all I'm going to say about that, okay? You can dig deeper, and this study of what text to include, what text should be excluded, is called, in the field, called textual criticism. So you can search about it and learn about it. There are books written about it if you are interested in the so-called textual criticism. If you have ESV Bible, sometimes for a more important one like this, you can learn a little bit from, from the footnote, okay? Or... Study Bible is the best. You would, you would get more of it. And um, so, yep. So where are we now in the, in the, in the Gospel of John? Because we we in chapter 8 at the moment. So it means we, we sort of like not really at the beginning. I said, we said earlier last year when we started that the book of John can be split out into two, two sections. The first section is John 1 to John 12. That's where we call the book of signs, where Jesus performs signs. In the book of John, the Gospel of John, we don't, they, the, the author, John, did not say miracle, but sign. So first part, book of signs, and then John 13 to 21 is the book of glory. Okay, so now we, we are in the book of signs section, chapter 1 to chapter 12. And so far, we've been following the life of Jesus, where he performs signs. We're learning about Jesus, who he is, and and all the signs that he performed, and what does it mean for us Christian today? So now, what can we learn from our passage today that perhaps very likely um, not written by John and not considered to be the Word of God, but actually happened? What can we learn from this? 
Well, I believe this passage here, this short passage, speaks of the heart of Christianity. It speaks about the heart of the gospel. It is that important. It speaks about truth and grace, the balance between truth and grace, justice and mercy, that some, sometimes it's really difficult to balance. You know, on, the, the Christians who want to focus on truth, but not so much on grace. And when, when you focus on truth and not so much on grace, you become very moralistic and legal, legalistic. We become prideful. You condemn other people. You become the kind of Christian that point fingers at others and look down upon others. But on the other hand, if, if you focus too much on grace and not so much on truth, you become liberal. Anything goes. You look at the command of Jesus, the command of the Bible, say, well, you know, I don't feel like that's applicable to me. And your life's a mess. You, you live your life freely and not like, in, like a, our Lord Jesus Christ at all. So there's this balance of truth and grace, justice and mercy that we could learn from this passage. So, for example, let me ask you when it comes to truth and grace, what do you do with a law or a command in the Bible as a Christian in light of the New Testament? Well, you obey it. If you believe in the Bible, in the God of the Bible, when you read a command, what do you do with it? You obey it. So that's the truth part. And the grace part, the grace side of things, tell us this. What happened when you failed to obey it? I don't know about you, but I realize the more I know about the Bible, the more I realize how much I fail in obeying the truth. And what happened then? And that's where the grace part comes in. So the, the right balance between truth and grace is very important in our walk with the Lord. So what can we learn from this story uh, about the woman who was caught in adultery? Three things we're going to look at to help us. Uh, the first one is the charge. What is the charge for this, to this woman? And what's the verdict? And what's the sentence? Pretty much a court language. Charge, verdict, and sentence. So the charge. Let us read from the beginning, 7.53 to 8 to first four so they went each to his own house the people being the crowd went home to his own house but jesus went to the mount of olives early in the morning he came again to the temple and all the people came to him and he sat down and taught them the scribes and the pharisees brought the woman a woman who had been caught in adultery and placing her in the midst they said to him teacher this woman has been caught in the act of adultery uh, just want to say quickly, verse 1, verse 53 and verse 1 says, They went each to his own house, the people went to his own house, and Jesus, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Mount of Olives is very likely, New Testament scholars believe, very likely to be the residence of our Lord Jesus Christ. So they went home to their, each to their own home, and Jesus went home as well to, to his place, Mount of, Mount of Olives. You can look at that in uh, Luke 21, verse 37. The charge, what's the charge here? The charge is straightforward. We are told that the woman had been caught in adultery, verse 3. And again, the second time, it says, caught in the act, in verse 4. Can you imagine to be caught in the act of adultery, not before, not after, in the act? This is what happened here. However, the Jewish law make it difficult for people to hand down a capital punishment like stoning someone to death. The Jewish law don't make it easy. Like anyone can be caught in adultery and get stoned to death. No, the, the Jewish law actually make it really difficult. In the case of adultery, both men and women, the men and the women must be caught in the act, right? Must be caught in the act. So you cannot say, oh, two women come out of, of a hotel room and they're caught. No, it doesn't work. In Jewish law, that doesn't work. It has to be caught in the act. And they make it difficult for someone to actually be caught in that sense. Uh, and also, there must be multiple witnesses. You cannot be a, one single man and say, there you go, I'm, I'm a witness. It doesn't work. There will be multiple witnesses, and these witnesses will be cross-examined, and their story, their account has to match. So the Jewish law actually make it really difficult 
Because if we are not careful, we may think that you know, the Jewish law is barbaric and it's so easy to stone a woman or a man to death and anyone can accuse anyone? No, it, it's actually not true. That's not the case. Uh, I want to illustrate from a story of Susanna. So this story of Susanna, again, it's in the Catholic Bible called Apocrypha. Uh, Christian, like us, Protestants, uh, evangelical Christian, believe that these events happen, this story happens, and it's there's a lesson to be learned but it's not god's word and this story of that susanna actually written in the apocrypha in daniel chapter 13. so we've studied the book of daniel only we finished only last week and we end in daniel chapter 12. so story of susanna happened to be in daniel chapter 13 in the book of apocrypha so the apocrypha is the collection of books written between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So between the last book of your Old Testament and the New Testament, you know, that two pages on your Bible, it's actually 400 years. And during that period, they've written a bunch of books of historical events and accounts, which is part of the book of uh, the Apocrypha, what we call the Apocrypha. So we, we can use that. We Scholars and Christians believe these books are historically true, uh, they're useful theologically, and, and we can gain fuller understanding, especially about the context of the Jewish law or the first century Judaism, the, their life during the first century. So we can use them to understand the context better when we read God's word. So that's the book of Apocrypha. And within that, in Daniel 13, I'm gonna read some verses from that, and we're gonna look at in, in chapter 13, you can Google this and you can find the Apocrypha online. You don't have to go out and buy another Bible just for this, okay? You can Google it, you can read chapter 13, Daniel 13, on the book of Apocrypha online. I'm gonna read from Daniel 13, first one. Uh, we, we don't have it there, but I'm just gonna read it to you. There was a man living in Babylon whose name was Joachim. He married the daughter of Hilkiah named Susanna a very beautiful woman and one who feared the Lord. Her parents were righteous and had trained the, their daughter according to the law of Moses. Joachim was very rich and had a fine garden adjoining his house. The Jews used to come to him because he was the most honored of them all. That year, two elders from the people were appointed as judges. Concerning them, the Lord had said, Wickedness came forth from Babylon, from elders who were judges who were supposed to govern the people. These men were frequently at Joachim's house, and all who had a case to be tried came to them there. These men last after Susanna. So I'm, I'm going to cut short. So these men who frequent these elders, judges who frequent at Joachim's house, last after Susanna, she's beautiful. Uh, so there's one hot, sunny day. Susanna baths in her garden. Susanna asks her maid to say, lock the door. You know, I want to be in private. I want to bath in the garden. But these two men hide themselves in the garden and last after her. And the two men approach her and demanded to have sex with her. When she refuses, they have her arrested, claiming that the reason she sent her mates away, see, she sent her mates away to lock the garden so she can bath in the garden. And these two men said she sent her mates away because she had an affair, having sex with a young man under a tree. You can read all this in Daniel 13. And verse 22, Daniel 13 says this, Susanna groaned and said, I'm completely trapped. For if I do this, it will mean death for me. If I admit to this, I, it means death for me. But if I do not, I cannot escape your hands, the hands of these accusers, these two elders. I choose not to do it in, in the sense of I will not give in to the request of having sex with these two men. And I choose not to do it. I will fall into your hands rather than sin in the sight of the Lord. That's what Susanna said. So Susanna refused to be blackmailed. He said, like, so be it. And she's arrested and about to be put to death. 
for the charge of adultery. This is when Daniel, in the book of Apocrypha, says, Daniel then interrupts the proceedings, shouting that the elders should be questioned to prevent the death of an innocent. The two men then were cross-examined separately about what they saw, their own accounts, and they, apparently they disagree about the tree under which Susanna had this affair, having sex with this young man. Uh, one of them says it was under a mastic tree, and another says it was under an oak tree. The size of these trees are different. The leaf size are different. It's just different tree. Uh, because they made it up, their the accounts are not the same. So the difference in size between a mastic and an oak tree makes the elders lie plain to all the observers. The false accusers are put to death and virtue triumphs. So that's the story of Susanna. So what does the law say about the sin of adultery? I'm telling you this story because I just want to show you that the Jewish law is just not you know, barbaric in the sense that you know, oh, you're, you're caught in adultery, let's put someone to death. No, it it does not. And uh, what does the law say about adultery? Let's look at Leviticus. We have to go back to Moses, right? The law of Moses, it says, Leviticus 20, verse 10. It says, if a man commits adultery with the wife of his neighbor, both the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Both of them. If a man is found lying with uh, now Deuteronomy, Verse 20, chapter 22, verse 22 onwards. If a man is found lying with the wife of another man, both of them shall die. The man who lay with a woman and the woman, you shall purge the evil from Israel. If there is a betrothed virgin and a man meets her in the city and lies with her, then you shall bring them both out to the gate of that city and you shall stone them to death with stones. The young woman, because she did not cry for help, though she was in the city, and the man because he violated his neighbor's wife. So you shall purge the evil from your midst. That's the law. The question is, when you read this law, if you are, have a lawyer invest in, you know, kind of mind, or you like Sherlock, if you like Sherlock Holmes, like I do, you would ask at least the question, she was caught in the act, right? That's what the accuser says. But where was the man? Have a read. She was caught in the act. Where's the man? Nowhere to be found. The law is clear in this matter. Both the man and the woman must be brought to trial. Both of them, if guilty, must be put to death. Yet only the woman was dragged in front of all the people, it says that all the people, don't miss that. It says all the people were there, all the people came to him, to Jesus, and they brought and put her in the midst of these people to shame her. The man was never to be seen. In John chapter 7, because this was last year when we look at it, I just want to remind us that we have met a man by the name of Nicodemus, right? And Nicodemus in chapter 7, verse 51 says this, when they want to arrest Jesus, Nicodemus, a Pharisee, says this in chapter 7, verse 51, thus all law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does. So Jewish law demand a fair trial a hearing. You don't just arrest people and condemn them, con- condemn them and put them to death, like this crowd who drag these women and say, "Let's stone these women." So Nicodemus, when they want to try and arrest Jesus, say, "Well, our law al- allows man to first defend himself, give him a hearing, let him explain his situation." Now, the people, of course, in this story that we read, did not seem to give this woman a chance at all to defend himself or her, defend herself, right? So just stone her. The accusers didn't give this woman a fair trial. Why? You must ask why. Well, the reason is given to us 
if we read carefully, because they weren't interested in justice. That's not their interest. Their interest is not that. They're, they were there only for one reason, and they're therefore, they did it to test Jesus. That's in verse 5. They wanted to trap Jesus, you see. Let's read from verse 5 to 6. To six. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. So what do you say to Jesus, right? They say to Jesus, what do you say? Moses says this, which we read from Leviticus. These, they say to test him. That's the reason they do it. They, they're not in it for justice. They're in it to test Jesus that they might have some charge to bring against Jesus. Not the woman, but Jesus. Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. This is quiz for all of you. You can tell me afterwards. What do you think Jesus is writing on the ground? All right? I'm not going to tell you. But what's the trap? They say they're, gonna, they, they're, gonna, they're doing it to trap Jesus, to test Jesus. What's the trap? Why is it a trap? Well, it's a trap because if Jesus said, do not stone her, then Jesus disobey the law of Moses. But on the other hand, if Jesus say, well, stone her, what happened? Well, then Jesus has been lying about himself because Jesus said, all you who are weary, come to me and I will give you rest. I did not come, Jesus say, for the sick. I, I di didn't come for the healthy. I come for the sick. But if Jesus says stone her, then the sick, what will happen? Well, Jesus will break the sick, will execute the sick. Jesus has been lying if Jesus say, come to me. All you who are weary and heavy laden. Because the truth then, if Jesus says stone her, then Jesus says, come to me and I will execute you because you are sinful. So they try to trap Jesus in this case. So the charge, what's the charge? The charge is adultery. Now, let us not be like the accusers and quick to point fingers at the woman who was caught in the act. But let us look at ourselves because these accusers fail to recognize their own sin. Let us not fail to recognize the adultery and the idolatry in our own lives. The church is adultery. You say, well, that's not me. Well, how about this? Matthew 5, 28, Jesus says this. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent, has already committed adultery with her in his heart. We all young ones before. This is not just for men. This is applicable for women too. Looking at men with six pack. Jesus say, I say to you, everyone who looks at someone with lustful intent has already committed adultery. So we, most of us, growing up would have this problem, adultery in our heart. And Jesus said, that's adultery. That is sin. That deserves death. Perhaps you are not like that. But how about this? Perhaps you love your family too much, more than you love our Lord Jesus Christ. Luke 14, 26, 26 says this. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father, and mother, and wife, and children, and brothers, and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Are you guilty of this one? Jesus said, if you don't hate your mother, your father, your wife, your children, your family, even your own life, you cannot be my disciple. Are you guilty of this? How about this? Maybe you, you are very much motivated about climbing the ladder of success. You come from a background of fa your father, your grandfather, are very successful people. And you're determined, I'm going to grow up to be an astronaut. I'm going to be the best doctor. I'm going to be the best surgeon. I'm going to be the best lawyer. I'm going to be the best whatever that is in your field. Maybe you love your career just a tad too much, perhaps more than you love Jesus. And to the rich young ruler, Jesus said this in Luke 18, verse 22. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And come to me and come and follow me. Are you guilty of this one? 
uh, all the property, all the wealth that you have, you say, that's Jesus. I want to follow you. Or are you hoarding? Are you guilty of this one? So don't, don't read this passage and say, oh, that's that adulterous woman. That's not me. The lesson here is, look at that adulterous woman and that's me. The charge for the women is just as valid as the charge for all of us. If you don't think so, come and talk to me and let's spend an hour and dig deeper into your life. It may not, get, it may not be comfortable, but if that's honestly, you're like, come on, I, Pastor Ferdy, I, I can't see any sin in my life. I'm just that good, right? Come and talk to me, spend an hour, and let's dig deep. And let's see. So what's the charge for you and me? Adultery, idolatry. So the accusers here, out to get Jesus. They want to trap Jesus. What is Jesus going to do? What is Jesus going to do? What is he going to say? Stone or not stone? Both are wrong answer, right? Jesus is going to be trapped either way. He says stone her. Or not stone her, it doesn't matter. That's why it's a trap. This leads us to the second point, the verdict. So what's the verdict? The charge, adultery, idolatry, the verdict. Let's read from verse 7 to 9. And as they continued to ask him, remember Jesus bent down and scribbled on the ground, ignoring them. They continued to ask him. And then he stood up and said to them, let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more, he bent down on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing before him. This is a genius stroke, right? This is genius. Jesus said both, yeah, stone her, but not actually stoning her. Because look at the result, one, one by one. From the oldest to the youngest, they went away. So what was the verdict? Well, guilty. Guilty. That's the verdict. The woman was guilty. Yes, absolutely. Jesus said, go ahead. Stone her. But if you're without sin, if you are not guilty of this woman's sin, throw the first stone course the bible does not teach that you know in order to persecute anyone you have to be sinless you have to be perfect but the jewish law say you cannot participate in the sin in this particular sin that you accuse of and cast a stone you cannot you just cannot you have to be blameless in this if you have to cast a stone so the woman was caught because what happened? He was set up, you see. I hope you get that far. He would, she was set up by the people. But it does not matter whether she was set up or not. As far as Jesus is concerned, she is guilty. As far as the people is concerned, obviously she is guilty. But this is also true for us. Sometimes we think we do certain things that are sinful because we have been trapped. We have excuses. You know, I grew up in this kind of horrible family. No wonder I turned out to be such a lousy person. We blame our parents. We blame our kids. We blame our boss. We blame our circumstances. But Jesus says there's no excuse when it comes to sin. You have to take responsibility for your sin. Even though for this woman, she was trapped. It does not matter. And this is true with the teaching of the Bible. James, the brother of Jesus, says this in James 1 verse 14 when it comes to sin. It says, each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by whom? By his own desire. What does he say? What is he saying here? He says this, no one sinned out of duty. No one. People sin because they like it. This woman was trapped, but she committed adultery because she wanted to, regardless of whether she was trapped or not. 
The lesson for us is this, we are responsible for our own sin. We cannot blame others. We cannot blame our circumstances. Um, when we sin, at that very moment that when we sin, we love that particular sin more than we love Jesus. That's what sin is. At that particular moment, we love that particular thing just a bit more than we love our Lord Jesus Christ, and that is sin. So the verdict is this. The woman is guilty. The charge is adultery. And if we are honest with ourselves, you and I, I hope, by this point, feeling the same way as this woman, guilty. We are guilty as well. What's the sentence? Our final point. The Bible is clear and we read it. What's the sentence? Death. Why are we still breathing right now? If God is a sovereign God, God who created everything, He didn't even have to snap His finger to wipe the world out. Why are we still breathing if the sentence is clear? Death. Right? Leviticus 20 verse 10. Surely be put to death. Death is the sentence here. The woman deserved to be stoned to death. But look at, this, but look at verse 11. With Jesus, when Jesus handed down the sentence to the woman. Verse 11, Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. And from now on, sin no more. That's stunning, isn't it? What does, this, what does this mean for us when Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you and sin no more. There's two points I want to mention here the first one is grace based forgiveness that's what it means for us grace based forgiveness some of you may think that your life is such a mess that you cannot possibly come to jesus and ask for forgiveness you say to me you say to yourself i just sinned this morning before i come to church i just sinned as i drove to church and this is easy if you're married in the car right to sin on the way to church. I'm married. I know all about this. Now, let me give you a bit of advice. If you're married and you drive to church with your wife and husband, it's so easy to sin on the way to church. And when that happens, you don't go like, that's it, I'm not going to church. You can go to church if you want. Because you, this is natural, you see, because you feel ashamed when you come to church. You have, you know, you got to put a face, right? If you're Asian especially, you're going you're gonna to put a face to your pastors. Like, you know, we gotta, I, know, I know you're angry with me, but when you come to church, you got to sit next to me, okay? And if, you, if it's so mad, you're so bad about this, you, you don't want to do that, you say, no, I'm not going to church. Let me give you a tip. Come to church. Be mad. It's fine. Because this church is not about saying, I'm, I'm perfect. I've got a beautiful marriage, you know. We never argue. Come to church and come to Jesus, lay it down to Jesus. When Jesus say to this woman, neither do I condemn you. It's a grace-based forgiveness that say anyone, anyone, whether you sinned five minutes ago, or three hours ago, or a week ago, you can come to Jesus. Because God's forgiveness is grace-based. Anyone can come to Him. Grace-based means it's not performance-based, you see. It's not because you're so loving all the time, husband and wife, or to your children, or to your parents, you are the perfect child. No, it does not mean that. Grace-based forgiveness means it's not based on your performance. God's forgive you. Grace means it's freely given to you at the cost of the giver, not at the cost of the recipient. That is what grace-based forgiveness means. It's freely given at the cost of the giver. And the second thing, what it means for us when Jesus said, neither do I condemn you, now go sin no more, is grace-motivated righteousness. Not only it's a grace-based forgiveness, but it is also a grace-motivated righteousness. To so the woman, Jesus didn't say, 
It does not matter how you live your life. I'm gonna love you. Jesus didn't say that, did he? Did he? Jesus said, "Sin no more." Jesus did not say, "Sin no more." Neither Jesus said, "Sin no more." I won't condemn you. Jesus didn't say that. Jesus said, "I will not condemn you." From now on, sin no more. Do you see the difference? I hope you do, because Jesus say, "How we live our lives once we are saved by grace matters to Him." Jesus did not stop with this woman by saying, "Neither do I condemn you." Now go. Jesus say, "Neither do I condemn you, but sin no more." That's very important. So grace-motivated righteousness means this: because we have experienced God's love, like this woman, then we can love Him and obey His command freely. We don't obey because we fear the punishment. Because the punishment has got. It's basically Jesus said, "There's no punishment. I do not condemn you, but now sin no more." So when this woman go out and sin no more, it's no longer about fear of punishment. Because Jesus has first said, "Neither do I condemn you." That's why it's a very important to pay attention here when that Jesus says, "I do not condemn you first, rather than sin no more." I do not condemn you. The order is very important because sometimes we like to think, "I'm a sinful person. I'm still mad with my spouse. Jesus can't forgive me. I need." I need to be perfect first before I come to Jesus. I need to, I need to not be mad first before I come to Jesus. Jesus said, "Don't." My grace and my forgiveness is grace based, not performance based. And our righteousness is grace motivated. We don't obey because we fear the punishment. We obey because we have experienced God's grace in our life. Grace isn't based on your performance. Let me sum up. Grace isn't given to you because you sin no more. It's the other way around. We sin no more because grace has been given to us. So only once you once you receive and experience this grace from God, the love from God, that we can truly love Him and obey Him. Perhaps you, some of you in this place, have been trying to get this the other way around. You've been treading. Walking and running on the treadmill of performance, try to gain God's love in your life. Try to be perfect. Try to obey God. Try to read the Word of God. Try to pray every day, and you always get frustrated because you know I I can't live up to the standard of what God wants. Of course you can't. That's why we need God's grace. That's why Jesus said to this woman, "I condemn you not. Now sin no more." See, grace says this: you are guilty. You and I are guilty as charged, but I will not condemn you. That's what grace is. You are guilty, but I will not condemn you. Now, how is that possible? Let, let's look at Romans eight verse one. This is a famous verse. This is our assurance. Romans eight verse one says this: there is therefore now no condemnation. For those who are in Christ Jesus, if you are in Christ Jesus, if you experience God's love in your life, you accepted God's grace in your life. There is therefore now no condemnation. How is this possible? Because if God is just, if He's just, then all sin must be punished. If you are sinful being, and this woman is an adulterous woman, then God cannot say. You are not condemned, because that would make him unjust. That would make him corrupt. Then how is this possible? Think about it. It's not possible, is it? For a just judge to not punish sin, it's just not possible. But it is possible with all of Jesus Christ. How? Well, remember, grace is given not at the cost of the recipient, but at the cost of the giver. Grace is when the guilty is not condemned. 
It doesn't cost you and I anything. It doesn't cost the woman anything, but it costs the giver everything. It costs our Lord Jesus Christ everything to say to these women, neither do I condemn you. Can you imagine how heavy and how difficult that is for our Lord Jesus Christ to say that? Knowing that she's guilty as charged, yet he said with love and compassion to these women, neither do I condemn you. It must be difficult because Jesus knows he has to be condemned in order for him to say to these women, I will not condemn you. Jesus saying this knowing that he must be punished for the sin of this woman so that this woman can walk free. Your sin, my sin, are paid by nothing less than the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. He paid it. That's why he can say to you and me, neither do I condemn you. Come to me. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18 says this. Flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that the body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. You were blood bought. So glorify God in your body. You see that? The same thing of, as what Jesus said. You were bought already by the blood of Jesus. Therefore, glorify God. Sin no more in your body. Don't mix this. Don't, don't turn this the other way around. Because of His grace, we must live a righteous life. It is so important for us to get this. We live a righteous life because we have experienced God's love for us. We must live in the balance with truth and grace. And Jesus showed us perfectly what that means. How to live in the perfect balance between truth and grace. Sometimes, Christians, we love to live on one side but not the other. Perhaps we use one side of this balance for ourselves this standard, and then another for someone else. For our lives, we say grace. When we make mistake, when we sin, we say grace, God forgives me, God's grace abound in me. But then when you look at your friend, what do you do? You give them justice, you rain down fire upon their life, you rain down truth, you give them scriptures, you say you're living in sin. Yet to yourself, you say grace grace it doesn't work that way we must have this balance between truth and grace especially to those who do who are not in christ who do not know the truth how do we treat say the lgbti community the people that you know do you rain down truth and justice in their life or you rain down grace and embrace them. Because to the adulterous woman, Jesus say, I condemn you not, now sin no more. Yet to the sinful people in our lives, by our standard, we don't say that. We say, sin no more. This is what the Bible say. Now we don't live according to what the Lord, our Lord, lifestyle and what he's teaching us truth and grace justice and mercy we must have the right balance so when we see our friends who are not in the lord who are living in sin don't beat them up with justice embrace them with grace and love and mercy and compassion Embrace them with God's grace. Because Jesus said to that person, I bought you with my blood. I will not condemn you anymore. You are free. Now sin no more. Let us pray.